Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Talking Schmidt, the podcast that comes out every Tuesday. Today on the show, we got Nathan Fletcher. <laughs> hey, let's give a shout out to the good friends at GoPro who have provided this camera new experience angle for us this week on the YouTube intro vibe. Whoa, look at that. Clear. We made it. Anyway, did you guys see that shit last week? No, no, no. Not in Johnny Depp's bed. Human fecal matter. I'm talking about Wes Kramer out there in San Diego throwing the first pitch at the Padres game. Hemme! Uh, we're going to do a special episode on coffee coming up here. I had an idea. Listener participation. We want you, the listener, to record your coffee ritual and email it to talkingschmidt at gmail.com. And I'm going to use the best ones in the episode. Coffee. What? Somebody said something about coffee. Every day I go down to Phil's Coffee and I get myself a greater alarm with just a splash of almond milk. Then the mind can start working and figure out how we're going to attack each day. Hey, speaking of coffee, shout out. Hold up. Oh, look at this. I just got an email from Rob Erickson that says, Hey, Schmitty, Danny's episode is killer. Here's an unplanned shot of him from FDR years back. Pretty high, bro. But I do want to give a shout out to my coffee crew bros. This week, I got two new coffees bought for me. Kent Vogel. Shout out. And Mikkel Garmendia. Shout out. Without further hesitation, I give to you from the North Shore of Oahu. This is Nathan Fletcher, and you are listening to Talking Schmidt. Holy cannoli. It's cool, like tonight is the night. <laughs> yeah. Oh, big dog's in. Do we really want to be here? Oh, everything's changed. We on? Schmitty? Talking Schmidt. Talking Schmidt, dude. <laughs> you gonna come out different. <laughs> shit, my pants, man. Your Rolodex is fucking deep. Holy shit. It's about the one. The one. The one. Who is this guy? Thinks he's tough shit. What's up? Come on, Schmitty. What the fuck? Tell the skateboard police to come get me. What is happening? I'm here for Greg Smith. Yeah! I agree. <laughs> Boom. All right. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Talking Schmidt. A uh, tad nervous and way more than that excited. Today we are riding with royalty out in the North Shore of Oahu. This kid is Nathan Fletcher. Nathan, how are you? Yeah, well doing good get up here phoebe yeah we're good just cruising how are those teeth uh, fucking bad but good yeah they're barely in there but uh what's left of them is all right how'd that happen oh how did that happen there's been a long line of uh issues okay yeah. and you were just sleeping and it just like popped out or something no, not sleeping at all. Flossing. I got veneers and uh, implants. I lost all my teeth. I don't have oh. teeth. I have just a whole mouth full of like misery is what I call it. But uh, <laughs> it's like a toilet bowl that's bolted into your gums. Okay. Yeah. Andy Roy's got those too. Like you don't have to worry about cavities. Oh, no, you do. Because I still got a couple of veneers. But yeah, when I watched Andy go through that, I was like, <laughs> I felt him. But yeah, I'd done all that. It, it's it's uh, no joke. Okay. Shit. Well, thanks for taking the time. Yeah. Thanks for having the time to take. What's the last year been like for you out there with like all the COVID conditions and everything? Have you been able to get more waves, less people or like what's the situation? Well, to, <clears throat> to be honest, it has been really nice as far as like the travel and stuff because they made it super difficult uh -huh. Stuck to leave. But as far as getting waves, it was like an insane year. But last summer I, uh, tore my Achilles tendon or ruptured it or something just really bad. So 
Uh, it's been about eight months or so, and I couldn't do anything for about six. So like right around four months, I started kind of doing stuff and then six months. And so the last couple of months, it's felt pretty good, but, but, uh, it really sucked. It really, it was like something I never experienced, you know? Yeah. It sucks to not be able to do what you want to do. It kind of gives you more, uh, like when you're able to do it again, you're like fired up to do it. Right. Cause you're down. Yeah, no, but you know, what's weird about this is like your ankle supports your whole body. So you're really fired up, but you just can't do it because it's still your ankle sore. So it's like, it's weird. It's like a very, you know, humbling or just like really puts you on the bench. solid. like, I broke my femur. I was only out for four months. And then, you know, by the year it was like pretty good. I'd still screwed, but the fact of just having a sprained ankle and having it take like eight months to heal and not surfing for six is just, I mean, I could have got surgery, I guess, but at the same time, I just let it heal and got to know my ankle better, I guess. Right. Get to know that you get to spend extra time. How many kids do you have? I got two kids and they are six and eight. Yeah. Six and eight. I saw the, uh, one of them's Jetson, right? Yeah. Jetson and laser. And you got that slam on Instagram, like the head. He does. All the time. He has, I mean, I don't know how many shots we have of him from face planning, but uh, yeah, his head's actually square in the front from hitting one corner so many times. Oh, damn. Yeah. So where, where were you born and raised? Me, I was born in San Clemente General Hospital and grew up in San Clemente in Capo Beach. Capo Beach for the first part of my life till I was like 12 and then San Clemente, which is real close. But And then San Juan Capistrano for years, like 12 years. And then I moved to Hawaii probably nine years ago. Can we go through the family tree a little bit? You you got like the most insane. I mean, the lineage is crazy. Like your grandparents, your parents, your brother, your Grayson. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's actually just what it is. It's normal to us. And then it's like really um, when it comes down to it, the way I look at it is like, we've just dedicated our lives to the sport and to sports, I guess, you know? And so like when my grandpa was surfing, there was no such thing as skateboarding. It wasn't like surfing was popular, you know? And so just so happens he was onto it. And then uh, my dad got going out with my mom because they met at a surf contest. So my dad was a surfer because, you know, that's how they met was at a contest. And so my mom comes from a surfing family. My dad was a surfer. And then it's like, I don't know, my aunt, my aunt Joyce, who is my mom's sister, she was a world champion, first time woman's world champion. Yeah. Um, and then my dad, you know, he's like, uh, he's just dedicated his life to, you know, the progression and the radicalness of the sport and trying to, I don't know, he was just part of that. Like when everything changed going from wood to foam from, you know, long boards to short boards, like when the whole world changed the sixties, you know? And so I just feel like he's just dedicated his whole life to progression and surfing. And so that's kind of like what he's done, you know, with the Astro deck and the toe ends and the surf movies and the team and everything, uh, you know, even taking us to the skate park when we were little kids, he would take us and be like, oh, okay, we're going to the big O you guys, blah, blah, blah. You guys got to do air skating. It's all about airs, man. These guys, they're air and skating. It's going to come and surfing for sure. And he'd be riding his mountain bike, but there was only like a couple mountain bikes in the whole world, you know, it's from Mert Lawwell. Yeah. Interesting. And so he's still doing it with his art, you know, and, and then Christian. So Christian was real into skateboarding too, as a, as a little kid, you know, and that crossed over into his surfing and, you know, kind of changed his look at the way he viewed surfing, like the transitions and the, um, you know, the culture was just so different at that time in surfing and skating. And so that really helped cross over his progression and like and change the sport literally you know for him going from flyaways to like actually making errors like we'll say seven out of ten yeah where that was unheard of and so yeah no it's interesting you know like like when you see skateboarding and stuff it's it's so ahead of its time now it's so like futuristic and they have such crazy control like when you watch you know danny way or bob or any of these guys like hit the crazy stuff you know, but it's weird, like, when you think about how there wasn't even skateboarding, you know, and it's like surfing has taken so long to get to where it's at, but it's like you're battling with the waves and the conditions and all the elements. And so skateboarders have a quicker opportunity for progression, right? Right. And 
and it's interesting just to see it all unfold. And so, yeah, like, you know, and so then Grayson comes out and it's like, he's kind of like a born in a surfing family grew up inland, Mm -hmm. but he skates all the time. So he took his skating more to like a surfing style, which was totally. So that's an interesting part. So like when we were surf, you know, like whatever my brother and stuff, we brought skateboarding into surfing. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was out, but you know, before people wore Reeboks and, you know, running shoes in, or, and if you skated, you wore skate shoes. Right. And then all of a sudden now everybody wears like a skate shoe, but it's funny how once Grayson got to be involved, he's brought in surfing back into skating almost, you know? So it's right. It's almost like full circle because the bottom line is really not, none of it's cooler than each other. It's just all about having fun and, you know, getting up after getting smashed and doing it again or watching people and, you know, progress. And so it's just like such a beautiful thing when you break down the essence of all of it. And there's really no difference between any of it. All you're doing is just trying to go out and enjoy yourself. And so it's kind of cool now in sense to see skateboarders like crossing over more. So, you know, like say from Pedro to Elijah Burl to current yeah. race. And there's a whole group of these guys. Now they all surf like surfing's okay. It's, it's like crossing over where, 10 years ago, 20 years ago is totally lame. You know, it's like all oh, surfers are kooks. Yeah. Uh, you know, it just, it's just a funny battle. And so in the end, like what we were saying about our family and stuff, I hope the reward that comes out of all of it being who we are is that, uh, you know, we get more surfers to skateboard and see that. And we get more skaters to surf and see that. So it's like, we become more multicultural as a team, as a group, you know, where it's like, Cause we're all in it together. And so it's kind of cool now that they've built all the skate parks, even the Santa Cruz skate park, how it has the full pipe. Yeah. I don't know. So for me, I feel like that's kind of like been our family tree is like why we're here is just to help the sports get along and get everybody just stoked. Right. It's, it is interesting. I was thinking that was going to be somewhat of your answer is like, it's all we ever knew. So that's like, it, it it just is what it was really but like yeah. to your dad's credited with being one of the first people to skate in a backyard pool um well he has pictures of it and it was the pool and it was the first pool ever skated and the deal is is there's other people that have pictures in the same pool but everybody's at the bottom of the pool uh this and that and so he was the first person to go up by the light and do a kick turn all the way up the transition Le- that's legendary that's so <laughs> sick He'll tell you, I invented the kick turn (laughs) and basically they can't find history before that. And another thing uh, that he did in skateboarding was he was the first guy to go from steel to clay wheels and forget the person who told him. But I think that came from, I don't even know, but the Smithsonian Institute told uh, Robert August, maybe Robert, you know what I mean? It was so it's it's interesting history because Hobie had those wheels. And so, you know, when you're thinking about kick turns and steel and clay wheels, there's really not much history before that. Right. And so when you go to the skateboarding hall of fame, you don't really see people that have had those, you know what I mean? There ain't the kick turn in there. It's uh-huh. like oh, other things that are bigger. Right. You know, We're talking going from steel to clay. That's a huge deal before your thing. Uh huh. Like a turn on transition coming up. Boom coming back down that's like uh you know revolutionary it changed the game that's what i mean that's that and like and and how old is christian about he's older right christian is uh i'm gonna say he's 51 or he's gonna be 51 in october did we pass october now we're coming into it yeah uh so he'll be 51 in october i'm 46 we're four and a half years apart so what was that like early days growing up being the younger brother like were you just always looking up to him trying to like keep the bar raised or were you trying to go a different direction than him like what was the vibe what do you mean bro christian fletcher's younger brother what do you think (laughs) (laughs) you seen the guy lately (laughs) no joke uh so you know what i mean my my thing was he loved games i wouldn't play no games here go play you know what i mean go play solitary go beat so he'd like to beat win oh yeah Uh uh-huh but no, uh, no contest. Cause I'm four and a half years younger. So now that I have kids, I realized I kind of ruined his life, you know, at like six years old, dealing with like a two year old, you know what I mean? Then at like, okay, 10, you got a five and a half year old cruising with you. It's like, okay, 15, you know, you're, you know what I mean? So 
Right. By the time we were 16 and, oh, you know what I mean? 11, whatever. He was mad. It was like, you know. <laughs> But then the other thing is, is he, he made me charge. So his thing was airs and tricks and all that. And he's always been like that, you know, just mm-hmm. air or whatever. And uh, coming back to it, you know, my thing was I could charge. I would go big. Right. And he hated that. <laughs> and he would be like, I remember when I was 12, my dad told me I could surf YMF. And Christian's oh, you can't go out there. And I was like, what do you mean? Dad told me I could. It was a 20 foot swell on the way down. We had this board. We made the board. It was like, I'd been waiting for this day. We were leaving that afternoon from Hawaii. I'm out there. And Christian looks at me, he's all, but if you go out, that means I got to go out. <laughs> and I'm all, well, I don't know. But he went out and caught five waves real quick because he's so good, you know? Like, right. he uh, was super, is supernatural. There's something about him. I don't know. It's hard to pinpoint it exactly, but there's something. And so he can go out and do that, bam, bam, bam. But then I waited, waited for, I don't even know, like an hour and a half. But then I ended up catching a big set. And so I always like to do turns and like, I don't know, more power surfing yeah. and charging. And he was like an air guy, but like, but he would do, I don't know. It's hard to explain. Uh-huh. He definitely made me who I am, you know, and then my dad made us who we are and all of it. It's uh, but yeah, he's the person I looked up to. I, I mean, there's nobody that I, I saw him do a backflip on his BMX bike, which I've told other people and maybe even shows and all of it. But when he was 12 years old and a lot across the street and you can ask Jason, he'll, he'll, Jason could attest for Christian being supernatural. Yeah. Well, when did you guys meet Jason? Jason, Jesse grew up in, in your zone, right? What do you mean? I don't, I can't remember meeting him. I was too young. Him and my brother were best friends in like fifth and sixth grade. Oh, wow. So they you would just, pick, you came they, out of the womb and met him. <laughs> they would pick me up and take me home from kindergarten. They'd have to go pick me up or first grade or in fifth grade and walk me home. And uh, then the same time my dad would be taking jason to big o right right he, 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 and we'd be listening to music he'd be showing whatever and it was like we'd be skating but i was a little kid i was six they were 12 so i have different memories you know my recollection's different than them they were skating and seeing like Dwayne and all these guys but i was just like floundering around a little kid but couldn't put on my pads but uh-huh. you know i remember watching them learn how to ollie they could ollie the little keyhole and you know it was interesting times because it was for me, it was like the big O, you know, it was uh, age skate visions just came out or was coming out soon. And that was like changed my whole life, you know, because you, you could see people you knew in a place where you're at. You could hear Agent Orange playing on the platform and see people skating. And it was like, oh, all of a sudden you just felt this whole new feeling of like, I don't know, it was just trippy. Let's see if your memory is the same as Jason's. He said, to ask you who shaved their head first, you or Christian. He said he has the Polaroid. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, for sure. It's metal. I shaved my head because I was over it. <laughs> and then we actually cut Christian's hair half of it off. Uh it uh Stevie or what's that guy's name? He's um Sammy Hagar at his warehouse. We were at some meeting and Chris we're like, oh let's cut your hair. And then we gave him like a jock hawk. Uh, you know, cut the sides off and he had it long. Then he picked it. What about like um, the role like your mom has played in the sport and everything, being a woman and being so strong. And then like Joyce, obviously first pro, like, I mean, this is pretty cool stuff too. Uh, yeah. You know what? It's a, it's actually beautiful. It's insane. like, I didn't even know till recently, but you know, my aunt Joyce, she was the first woman world champion and she was also the first woman to serve pipeline, wow. which is pretty hectic. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. That's amazing. And so, yeah, my mom's dealt with, you know, men, surfers, dudes, assholes, whatever you want to call them, her whole life. And so, you know, uh, she's conditioned. She's conditioned and she's calloused, but she's filled with love. And so it's like, you know, she talks a certain way. She acts a certain way. She has to carry herself a certain way. Otherwise, you crumble, you melt under scrutiny you know uh-huh and so uh it's made her a strong woman it's um she's read i don't not a million but we're gonna say you know in the ten thousand number um range of books you know so she's read at least ten thousand books more than wow. that like a whole room full of books you know what i mean yes yeah. and, and she didn't go to high school. she's self-educated everything she knows she's experienced she's done she's she's uh been a part of you know so 
she's not speaking from speculation standpoint. She's not speaking from like, you know, the other side of the fence. She's lived it. She's dealt with us. She's dealt with uh, everything all the way from my brother to my dad to myself. And now she deals with my kids and Grayson and, you know, all the different things from, we'll say, interventions to, uh, you know, uh, calling parents to tell them their child's past. I mean, my mom has been through thick and thin through the, the glory of, you know, having a 50 year marriage. Right. That's so it's, like, so it's like there's so many different levels and layers to the whole uh, romance, you know, uh. that it's like, I don't know anything different, really. And and I couldn't imagine anything different. And to be honest, like their contribution to the world and to the world of surfing, as far as, you know, sharing their love and also uh, their love for the sport and and the progression, like they've dedicated their whole lives to give back, really. And uh And it's taken a team. It's taken both of them to be able to do that, really. And so my dad's done his thing. And then it's taken my mom to help him. And then my mom, you know, my dad helps my mom. And so, you know, and they all help us, me and Christian. And and so we all get along somehow. And I don't know, my mom, (laughs) my mom's the backbone of it all. You know, she she's the one on the phone and calling and making sure this guy talked to that guy and and Grayson did that. And, you know, did you call your tax guy and blah, 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 blah. It's like. You know, she's not missing a beat by any means. And um, and it's just from being sincere and loving, you know, loving us. Unconditional it's, love. It's pretty epic. It's like a real inspiration, like on so many levels. Just see, like you said, 50 years of marriage right there is like kind of unheard of in today's standards. So, well, they also love each other and they love their kid. They've done everything. You know what I mean? It's like. Some people don't even know each other after 50 years, though. They might have stayed there, you know, but so and they've dedicated. They took us out of school young. They showed us this life like uh, do this. And it was totally unaccepted at that time. Uh You know, totally alternative. There was no money like in sports and Olympics. And, you know, it was it was spiraling the other way at that time. You know what I mean? Just like it is now. It was ups and downs with it all. And so. Now you see everybody's out of school. Nobody goes to school. They're all pros. They all have coaches, nutritionalists, and all this weird stuff. Right. And, you know, at that time it was like, so it's just when you see the difference in times and the difference in parenting and the difference in people, like they're just cutting edge all the way. And they've, uh, you know, they've dedicated their lives to it. And so they've gotten a good result. Mm-hmm. I feel like, and, and they're still striving. They, they're not done. <laughs> they haven't yeah. got the results they're looking for just yet. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, I'm making more. T- let's talk about jumping off the cliff at steamers. Okay. Yeah. How did, was, how did that all come about? Did you think about it or was it spontaneous? Well, like, what, there, did you go there to do it or I, were you doing it in a moment? I jumped off at blacks first. And the reason I did it, cause we were bored and the waves were small and I was with Nelly and I was like, Oh, I'll just jump up. Boom. We'll get a shot jumping in. And then it was like, Oh, that was kind of killer. I could probably make that. And so I started thinking about it. And uh, then I was like, you know what? Steamer lanes is spot because you can run with the wave and jump over to it because I figured out you need inertia going towards the beach. Uh. But then I also didn't want to do it small. I don't know. Yeah, it was just something I did because I was like, you know what? Like, I don't know. It's just part of going big. Like, even like a soy jumping off a roof into the ramp. It's like, what did that do? That got Danny way to get a helicopter and jump in at the hard rock. And then it was like, that just wasn't quite big enough. So then fucking they put the mega ramp ramp in front of the the uh mega wall and all this you know through sh- through danny way motor crossing snowboarding um the helicopter involved all these things it just took everything to like a bigger level right and so my point was was like oh if i could stick something from like eight or ten or twelve or however feet high then people could do airs like that high and know that they could make it uh-huh. because- because my whole thing is like everybody's done all this stuff, like all these errors and rotations and grabs, tri- fucking triple double grabs, whatever it is. Uh-huh. But, but the fact is, is we still haven't like reached our maximum potential just in height and style. So it's like you could do a 720 double grab and be like a foot and a half above the lip and whatever. It's great. It looks like, you know what I mean? It was really hard to do. But then it's like, did you see the guy in the Olympics who hit that backside wall where he did the 20 foot back, 25 foot backside air, the Japanese kid? Yeah. So that's like the same thing. It's like, 
you know, you could do like a 720 or there's still potential to do your 25 foot backside method, like gracefully at pipeline, you know, or whatever. So, Fuck. so my point is, is like, I don't know. I just feel like there's so much to be done, like on the big scale to where it's like Christian had to do errors and make it a bunch. And then it's like, then people did rotations and all that. But the fact of the matter is, is like, we still have the mega ramp left in surfing, you know, like it's still out there. We haven't quite tapped it and we've done everything else. You know, we've skated mini ramps. We've skated mini ramps with PVC coping. Oh, we got flat bottom now. It's like, yeah, we got flat bottom. Can you believe it? The ramps are huge. And then it was like, I don't even, you know, the, the whole, like, cause it started at vert, right. Little U pipes. And then it was like, Oh, you couldn't have those anymore. So all the skate parks. So then it went to the mini ramp. And I remember the first mini ramp, the scab ramp and Dana point. Then it was like, Oh, this other ramp popped up. It had Masonite. Nobody ever even heard of Masonite. It was like, we skated. I forget. I think we were with Jason. We skated all the way across Dana point to go to this ramp with Masonite. <laughs> so slippery. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's the same thing with surfing, like with boards and like the evolution. It's just so slow because we don't have the, uh, the set course. You know what I mean? We can't skate over to the ramp with Mason. It's like, we go down to the beach, it's blown out. You don't get that try that day. Right. Oh, I don't know. So it's just kind of funny. It's like a funny battle. But the fact is, I feel like we're right there and all the kids are just so good now that it's like, uh, things are going to go next level, like in the next 10 years, even like in skateboarding, like, uh, with the little kids. Cause now I've been paying attention to it <laughs> and it's like, they got these little Brazilian. I don't even know where they're from. Japan, Brazil. Yeah. But you're, you're like, the kids are doing 900. They're like eight years old. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, wait, that's not right though. Uh huh. It's crazy. And like, even, and the girls too are like progressing like to a whole new levels. And it's just like, how is everyone so goddamn good? <laughs> Well, that's my point. What happened to having fun? <laughs> yeah. Like you don't even get a childhood. You have to be like pro. Right. Well, yeah. Then you have your soccer mom mentality that like they're just taking you and, and grooming you to be the next Nija or something. Yeah. Which is probably good for some kids, but some kids don't like there's guys that don't turn pro till 30 and uh, surfing. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like, I don't know. There's just no right way, but definitely the little girls, the sky Browns in surfing right now, like there's probably like six of them or eight of them, but they've definitely, because they skateboard, they're actually, they're the most progressing part of surfing right now, for sure. It's uh, under 14 year old girl division. Like wow. they're, they look like, they look like junior men's now before, you know, where you're like, holy smokes like these girls just rip like airs reverses turns where i feel like in the last generation it just wasn't quite the same you know like it's pretty pretty awesome to see what skateboarding's done for the girl surfing yeah it's cool i mean i think like a bunch of my friends we've been yeah. trying to uh nice uh you know we've been trying to just go out and have fun and film some surfing and stuff on the side and stuff and it just the skateboarding surfing and vice versa the surfing to skating like it all complements each other yeah well it's it's pretty cool you know what is even great too what feels so good is skating with your board to the beach ah. you're you're feeling like a king doing that i swear <laughs> like i don't know it's pretty cool though it's something that i i don't do it really much anymore but uh, that was something I truly enjoyed. So when you jumped off steamers and then Danny Way's doing the helicopter, the combination of those things, does that kind of inspire you to the helicopter? Well, a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, because I just, yeah, Danny Way has been a huge inspiration to everything. Like, you know, like I, I look at Danny Way in my opinion, you know, he's like an evil can evil of action sports and growing up with him as a friend, you know, I don't, I don't really know Danny too much for skating, as much as I surfed and rode motorcycles and snowboarded with him. Okay. So we were close friends at that whole time doing those things. And so then to watch him go on and create the mega ramp, but went to the track and rode a bunch with him, you know, we'd ride, went snowboarding a bunch with him, saw him hit all the kickers. He was the first person I ever saw do an inverted like McTwist on a snowboard because uh -huh. he could, right. So he went boom, whapped it, bam. But yeah, and so my whole thing was watching him progress and take things. And we don't have anything in surfing that we can make. But 
with a helicopter, my whole thing was after jumping off steamer lane, I figured out that you need to be traveling with the wave at the same speed and just step over and fly down to it. Right. Uh And the thing that sucked about the helicopter day, in my opinion, was it was a super expensive day. Everything had to be done on that day. And it took an hour for each run to get out of the water, to go around, to get to the picked up was an hour. So no matter what, I only got like six or seven tries after seven hours. Right. And it wasn't two days of insurance and budget. And so it just had to be done. And so in my mind, what I thought and what I saw, like with the helicopter and everything was one thing. And it was like, after jumping off steamer lane and all this, I wanted to like, Oh, but then when it came down to like 72 camera angles, insurance, like uh, the FAA with a flight plan and like all this crazy stuff, all of a sudden it just couldn't work out the way I envisioned it. So it was like, I had to stick it that day, which Uh I did, but truthfully, like what I would have wanted to do was like, say a week of trial, you know what I mean? Like we just flew around one day before to get a good glance at like what peak we were going to use. Uh-huh. But the fact is, is just jumping at like, you know, because say you did it 30 times, there's a chance of getting lucky. And so it's going to take luck on uh, something like that, where it's like, Oh, you could go way big. So my point is I did it, but somebody has the potential to do it much bigger. Yeah. Uh. And so it's just the same as anything. Like, it's just a floor plan of like, I didn't do it to be like, oh, I did this or did that. I just did it because I just thought, oh, somebody was going to give us a budget. Then we could pay for the rest of the movie. Yeah. And then it was like this great idea I had. But when it came down to the stipulations of everything, it just had to be done. So now when I watch it, I cringe Mm -hmm. if I, I can't even watch it really. But like, but in the movies, it's a great movie. It's a great story. Like, how I crash, like all this. And so to be honest, it's partial Hollywood, partial reality, uh, trying to cross over and get a budget out of the movie world, but make it cool to uh, like um, a core surfer skater as well, which is almost impossible to do. Mm -hmm. And so working with people, I don't even know. It's kind of like a joke, but at the same time, it helped me in my life. And it's just another tool to, you and know, who, ma- who made that vans? No, no. Uh, Michael Abowitz. Michael Abowitz. Okay. Rad. Yeah. So he did it. Yes. And I'm thankful that he went ahead and, you know, he worked really hard and we worked really hard and the movie came out and it was just kind of like, it didn't get marketed right, but uh-huh. the movie great. So I don't even care. What's the, is it? What's the name? Heavy water. You just influenced somebody. Did you do a front side 540 no handed before? Uh, well, that was at the lane one time before anybody had done it. And so I went all the way around and then landed and fell in 98. But the reason Jason, he was there, so he saw it. Yeah. But that was in yeah, that's in the magazine stuff. And yes, I did. Wow. And backside yeah. too. Yeah, whatever. It is what it is. Some people know, some people don't, but I'm not really trying to tell people, you know what I mean? It's not really a big deal. It's just it is what it is. Sure. Well, a big deal is getting as many covers as you did in one month. Chopu. Yeah, that was a big deal for sure. That was totally accidental and greatly. Um, accidental. Well, I just, you know, I didn't do, <laughs> I just went on a vacation and then I caught that it was all, you know, I didn't even mean to be there. It was like, a, oh. I showed up late with Bruce and just kind of like on a vacation. I caught the wave of my life two weeks before. So I don't know. I just was like, oh, if I surf, I surf. If I don't, I don't, whatever. But then just so happens I only caught two waves and that was one of them. And so like, even when I rode the wave, you can't see it. Right. So when I rode the wave, it was like, Oh, I survived killer. Like I thought it was like everybody else's people were like hugging me and crying and like all this stuff. (laughs) Oh, you guys are tripping. Like (laughs) the next day I got a picture of the wave and I was just like, Holy smokes. Like I just could not believe it was me. And so yeah, it was totally accidental. And I didn't even know I did that until like the next day. Cause I went back cause I was, Oh, these people are acting so weird. Like, I don't know what's going on. I'm just going to go back and um, just cruise. But then when I saw the picture, I thought I was wiping out or something. I was like, wait, what? Trying to make sense. Cause it was on my phone. Yeah. But then I realized it was, that was me just trying to, I was that small, but I thought it was like my head or I don't even know. That's what I was wondering. Like well, after it's over and you see the footage or the photos or everything, is it way more like when you're in the, in it, do you not really know how big it is? No, you don't know anything. You're just surviving. 
<laughs> that was just some weird swell. It's nobody's seen it like that. So it's just doesn't get like that. It was just one of those deals where uh, I was going through a lot of tragedy and trauma and all this bullshit in my life and trying to find my way. And, you know, Andy had just passed and Cyan had just passed. And, um, and God just said, yo, bro, <laughs> have at it. And then once I survived, because I didn't think I was going to survive, right? When I was falling, because <laughs> I was like, make it, make it. All you got to do is make it. I don't even care. Uh-huh. I get, and all of a sudden I was like, oh, shit, I'm falling. I'm going to die. And so I said, okay, just relax. You know, you've had a great life. It's been good. Just, <laughs> oh, fuck. just uh, whatever happens, happens. Just remember what weighs up and just try and hold your breath as long and be as calm as you can. It just, after a while, I just came up and my neck was all hot. It felt like it was going to rip me piece from piece, you know? Wow. And I grabbed. And I was like, oh, my, my head's on. I was like, holy shit. And then I looked at my arms. My arms are on. And I was like, oh. And I was like, oh. I was all together. I could not believe it. I was all, no way. Take me in. Fuck, yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, that's what I mean by, it. everything was accidental. So it was like, I caught the wave. You know, somebody borrowed a ski. I didn't have a ski. And then I was like, oh, here, here comes one. You want this one? Sure, I'll go. Uh-huh. And then I was like, didn't know it happened. And then in the end, I won all these awards for it and got all those covers and uh yeah so it was just like a i don't know it was just some sort of blessing and it really, was like 12 covers right i think it was eight but i eight? Knew, knew after that like there was a couple more months that went by but i knew my life was time to change and have kids i like i succeeded on my goal to try and like ride these waves and that was that i was like you know and i still do it but like after that i was like i really started analyzing things like okay is it going to be gnarlier than this like is it worth dying for because I drowned and all these people were drowning. And, and uh, so then you'd be like, oh, am I going to get more barreled than Chopo? And I'm like, no, nothing's going to be like that. So now I don't even care. Like, I just do everything. But it took me like, you know, a year of contemplating like, oh, do I just, uh, you know, because it's like your ego and your balls and then your common sense arguing and telling you like, you know what I mean? When you look at all the signs, it's like, oh, Maybe if I keep doing that, I will die. Maybe it did that so I could just be happy with what it gave me. I don't have to search my whole life for like a never ending high. It's like, be stoked with what you got. You're never going to get more. It's like, you didn't die. Yeah. Well, so, so now I just look at it. I can't even believe it's me, you know? And I, it's just kind of a funny thing. I laugh and, and then I'm like, you know, my kids, we talk about it. And it's just trippy because I'll even like, we'll see these pictures and I'll be okay. You guys, when I was a little kid, I remember seeing if I even get a picture of myself at pipe on a wave that big, that's good, you know? And then it's like, all of a sudden you'll be surfing pipe and then you're going to get pictures on those waves. And then you're going to be like, oh, if I get a picture over here, it's going to be good. And then, and then I'm like, and then there's that shot now at Chopo and I look at it, I just laugh. I don't even know what to think. It's like, it wasn't even intentional, you know, it was just, but just remembering like, oh, if I do this, it's going to be, I'll be like that. Or if I do that, <laughs> and, uh, you know what I mean? It's like some bar that's going to make you happy. So then I like look at it. I'm like, oh man, I don't know what to think. It's like, I don't even know if I'm happy. I don't even want my kids to do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you're like, fuck, you're out of your well, mind. Well, yeah. Being a father, I think it changes your mentality on a lot of that stuff. Right. Yeah. It's just, but that's what I'm saying. Like I would have done anything for that, but all of a sudden you're like, fuck, I wouldn't want him to do that. Like what my parents think. Yep. <laughs> that's so. the tricky one. That's where we, I struggle, I mean, with the whole everything, like partying, everything. It's like, fuck, I wanted to do it. But then, like, it's like, you don't want your sit, you know, it's like, oh, how do I not be a hypocrite? Yeah. Well, I think uh, I can't not be a hypocrite. I just, if I did it, I did it. I don't do it. Everything's a stage and it runs its course. And uh-huh. sorry, I didn't make the better choices in my younger part of my life. But maybe because maybe now that they're born, I can make better choices. You know what I mean? So I'm not trying to. So there's a lot of explaining to do for sure. Oh. <laughs> you just, just use my wisdom. We're, we're blessed. <laughs> yeah. Just be stoked. Or you don't got to do what I did or your parent. You know what I mean? You're, it's Wis- in there. You look down and you see just that personality right in them. Every bit of, you know, their uncles and grandparents and dads. And, you know, you're like, oh, God, this is going to be interesting. Here we go. Yeah. Have you ever been more scared than, than that one? Uh, yeah, for sure. That, I wouldn't, I mean, I was scared, but I was in like some magical bubble moment where time and space weren't even part of reality. And it was just not really a thought. There was times in Chile where I was underwater and went through rocks and drowning and blacking out and seeing my whole life and all that kind of stuff and had no help or anything. And so 
that's a whole different story. But yeah, that and so my wife was pregnant at the time, could see my baby in the alter, like in the embryonic embryonic fluid and stuff. Like met Laser before he was born from mm-hmm. dying. It's like interesting. And then the day he was born, we were surfing across the street from our house, and our friend Kirk Passmore pearled, drowned, died. We couldn't find his body. And that evening, my wife's water broke, and we went off to labor with uh, our first son. So, oh, yeah. Hey. Son, the day he was born was like such a whirlwind of like the circle of life, you know, it was like in the morning we're looking for a body. And then in the evening we're at the hospital delivering a baby. <laughs> it was just That's like, insane. Like, on. So with all these, like, um, what is that called? Like, uh, signals, you know what I mean? Yeah. Events, uh, red flags. <laughs> it just started to like, look at him and be like, okay, what's right for Nathan. It doesn't really matter what's right for like, the surfing world or for my ego or for anything like what's right for Nathan and for his kids. And, and so the whole conclusion is it's all right, but it all has to be based around fun and love. And so uh, whatever they're doing, it's fun and loving, you know what I mean? And so no matter what, I feel like in that sense, you're going to have a good outcome. Yeah. Wow. That's heavy, man. That's a heavy day. (laughs) Holy shit. And now, another first impression with Sid the Package of Bruzy. The last summer of Water Brothers on the beach, after nearly 20 years, we had constructed a 10 foot vert ramp made out of steel, nine with a foot. And we've had everybody coming over the, over the years, everybody. And we heard of a bloodshot tour coming. And uh, being a great friend of uh, the family and Astro Deck was putting it together and at the time he was making skate culture boards Herbie was with Christian uh, Fletcher Christian Asoy Nathan etc etc they had a rock band consisting of Nathan on guitar Ray Bones Rodriguez on guitar Rick Rock on drums Christian Fletcher on bass Greg G.T. Tomlinson, the lead singer. The deal was they pull in the town, skate the ramp all day, hang out at the beach, do whatever they want to do. That night, we had a club rented for them in town. I believe it was called Threes at the time on Broadway. They were staying in Winnebago's, and we had that pool next to a friend of ours' house. The following day, everyone had packed up in the morning and they went to Providence, Rhode Island, where the party arrived at Fred Smith's skate hut. Fred Smith and Rob Murphy were partners in a building in Onlyville called the Skate Hut. Legendary. Both Water Brothers Ramp and the Skate Hut Ramp. Legendary. That's the first time I sort of got to know Nathan. I couldn't tell you how old he was at the time. I'd say maybe 12, maybe 13. He was into totally ripping on guitar, ripping skating, and ripping, sur- and ripping surfing. Um, there wasn't too many waves that day in town. They're only in town for a day. So he got to skate the vert ramp, but I don't think he went surfing or anything like that. I think his brother went out at Ruggles just for the hell of it, like a foot to knee high, I can't remember. But anyway, that's where I met Nathan. Um, Awesome dude, natural talent, athlete, anything he did. Every time I see him, it's a great friendship. And uh, I saw him in the Pipeline parking lot. I saw him once at the Volcom house all in Hawaii about seven or eight years ago. I go to all the trade shows. I did a lot of hanging with Christian. He was a lot more around. Nathan was more private, you know, doing his own thing. So that's my recollection of a great guy, great man, great father, rock and roll ripper, Nathan Fletcher. Hey, it's Corey at Blue Plate, 3218 Mission Street. Come see us. Meatloaf, fried chicken, deviled eggs, Dollar Olympia beers. We're here every day of the week. We got a garden and we got smiles on our faces. Come let us make you happy. Head on down to your local shop. 
What about uh, your favorite beach you've traveled to? You know, to be honest, my favorite beach is anyone I'm at that day because I love going to the beach. I moved to Hawaii so I could live at the beach, you know? And so like anywhere here, you go to the beach every day or whatever. Uh. But, you know, you go to California everywhere. So the thing is, you could be in the biggest city. You could be in L.A., right? And you go down to the beach at Santa Monica, Venice, fucking armpit of the world. (laughs) But get to the beach and that's the great wide open right there. That's the vast outdoors right in front of you. And so all you do is jump into that ocean and you're in the biggest uh, aquarium in the world, you know? And so it's like, you could have 8 zillion people right on the coast, but as soon as you get to the beach, boy, it's like, you can just feel that you're, you're safe. You know what I mean? You're in nature. And uh, it's kind of funny. So like, even if you're in Venice or something like, Oh, and you get to the beach, you're like, Oh, it's beautiful. Red. Oh, look, the birds are here. You know what I mean? You're like, totally. and so I would say, you know, different beaches have different things. Obviously, Pipeline, Chopo, uh, you know, Waimea, any of the big waves on those days, it's like you're there. It's a, it's a nature's wonder. Uh-huh. And then there's other beaches that you go to on days like, say, Venice or Doheny that uh, that day they have something to offer. And so whatever it is, you know, there's beauty at the beach. That's I guess that's my point, because you could be in you know, Tijuana, you go down to the beach, it's killer. Mm. And, and so you'd be in New York, you get to the beach, you know, any beach. And so it's like right there, that's where the outdoors start. And you jump out, you go swim one mile away from where you're standing on that beach. You go swim one mile straight. You'll be scared for your life. I'll guarantee it. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah. Cause you don't know what's out in that world. Like it's like, and so it's kind of cool. It's like, it's rad. It's like the globalizer, you know? Yeah, I mean, have you you've been to SF much surfing? Mm-hmm. I was just there the other day at Fort Point watching guys surf off the rock. Oh, about under a, Golden Gate Bridge? Yeah, about two weeks ago. And then they were over at Ocean Beach. And then we went to the next one down and we went to Santa Cruz. Yeah. The little tour. Yeah, we were doing some stuff, but uh but yeah, we were just there. Do you got a good story about Mavericks? Man, I, I, just, I don't know if it's good, bad, or... Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, Mavericks has been a special place to me because it's the first place that was like a small wave, but a big wave. And so that's why I liked it so much. Um, it's given me some of the rides in my life and, you know, some of the biggest defeats in my life, too. Like, the best day during a contest, you know, and it's like you can't catch a wave. But then there's other days, no contest where it's like you catch a great left. One guy gets a shot, but it's like, you know, when you catch a good one there, you're, you're, cry, you're in tears. But then it's like, you know, my friend Sion, who I was with, passed away when I was there together. And, uh, you know, that's been the biggest tragedy in my life for sure. And so, you know, I have the biggest tragedy from Mavericks too in my life. And so I, I got everything from Mavericks. It's, you know, it's, it's, beautifully scary and everything in between i don't know how to explain it but uh right bro one of my you know great white experiences out there um death experiences tears of joys experiences experiencing friends that you watch them do the craziest thing in their life you meet new people from other countries uh you go you know afterward to the old princeton landing and then the people you know, the local community that support the big wave. I, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's really special to be honest with you, Mavericks. It's like no other place, no other big wave. Cause it has, it's like a city, big wave SF crowd. Then it's like a Santa Cruz surfer pro crowd. Yeah. And then a, a touring, just big wave, gnar dude <laughs> crowd. So it's like, you see guys from like Andrew Marr from South Africa or 45 years old, just charging or Robbie page. But then you see John Mel, like, you know what I mean? It's, it's, uh, everybody's there cause they love it. Nobody's there for any other reason, but pure, just like live and die for it. And so, yeah, living nearby. I mean, it fires up the community when they're, it, cause it's a window. They're not sure when it's going to be. So it's just like, it's, oh, they it's know. from, they, they know, know. Oh, oh, they, okay. they, it <laughs> they comes, pretend they don't know. 
they get ready. It's a spectacle. You know, yeah. that's like for sure when the waves get big, it's, you know what I mean? It's traffic. You can't even move. People are just like, ah, like, and you look out and then you see people ride one. You're like, holy, do you see that guy? That was nuts. And then the helicopter saving people, whatever, you know, it's just like, it's yeah. so extreme. Everybody's feeling the energy. It doesn't just, it's not just the surfers on those days. Uh huh. What do you think about the wave pools? Are you down for them or are you anti? I love them. Yeah. I love wave pools. I mean, think, did you like going to play in some kid's pool when you're a little kid? Yeah. It's like, well, now they got them where you can just, it's like, uh, it's like a perfect lawn tramp in the pool. So it's like, if you skate, you know, it's like, oh, it's just like a perfect groomed, like parking lot with a lawn tramp. So it's not the best thing, but you can go work on your pop and your tricks. And you know, there's no, uh, there's it's all turns right so you just wait your turn there's no jockeying for waves so you're like high-fiving your buddies waiting in waist deep water move over catch your wave oh what a, it's so it's it's a total different side of surfing but i like it because i'm so used to the aggressive like male uh this is mine i'm a local ah, like all these things and so that whole side of it it takes that out it's like a uh, country club community uh umbrellas in your like pina colada surfing kind yeah. of trip maybe yeah. not but you know what i mean it's like i don't know it's kind of like temperature control i'm claiming for uh, assisted living if you could have when you get to a certain age and you have your your apartment wave pool you got your time slot you got your buddies you know what i mean it's all everything's 80 degrees oh, that's <laughs> you, <know it>. I mean? <laughs> you can't get better than that i was thinking oh so that's like the future so maybe i'm not there yet but in like 30 years, if you just have your spot at your timeshare and it's just like people take care of you, you go out for a surf, even a boogie bar, just lay down and ride. Uh, a few. Yeah. The Talk retirement to, zone. Yeah. Have your, put your, put your teeth on the table, <laughs> uh, you know, oatmeal talk shit about 2020 and how crazy those times were. Uh, you know what I mean? I don't know. It's just like, but yeah. So I think for the progression of the sport with the kids and the tricks and the repetition, the Olympics, all that other stuff that comes with uh, the times we're in. Yeah, it's great. Um, Tom Curran put it the best, to be mm. honest. With you. And he's, he went to the wave pool and, and it was like, he's like, and he has a picture of the wave pools. He's all, do you like oranges off the tree or do you like them out of the can? Which do you <laughs> and he's all i prefer oranges off the tree out of the south of france but if there's no oranges available i don't mind shopping and having some uh canned oranges as well okay so i just and so that's all he said but it was a picture of the wave pool right yeah and, and so i thought yes uh do you like nice fresh oranges off the tree hard to get seasonal all that or do we go for the canned fruit which is you know which is good too so mm. it's just the same thing. Okay. When you're growing up outside of the family, who are your inspirations? Who are you like stoked on to put up on your wall or like looking up to or whatever? Man, putting up on my wall. Well, all the skaters, um, all the stylish skaters. I'm guessing Jay Adams. Yeah. You know, all of them, not all of them, but we'll say Jay, Christian, Jason, Bob, 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 you know, uh, don't want to go two into names. I, I'm trying to save my life over here. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, all the skaters, you know, and then, you know, like I got to say, I love Metallica when, when, when I was a kid and it was like, all of a sudden I heard heavy metal is like in say agent orange. I'd heard agent orange and the vandals and this and that. And then it was like, Christian, they'd like listen to Motley Crue and Van Halen and Rat and all this stuff, you know? And then it was like, I heard of this band, Metallica. And it was like, God, I just remember being like, what is this? This is insane. And then they're like, you think this is rad? You should hear this band, Slayer, bro. And it was like, Slayer. And it was like, holy smokes, this is even here. <laughs> like, what's going on? And so, I was really into heavy metal because I like punk and whatever that whole music, but then I want to learn to play guitar. And so it's like, once I heard these, these metal bands, like the Chrome eggs and swear and DRI, yeah. 
It was like thrash and metal and punk and everything, but technical. Uh, and so, yeah, I had a whole wall of like metal guys, you know, on my wall. I think my dad still has a collage, but it was definitely <laughs> like Metallica, a bunch of Metallica. And then I was super bummed when uh, Cliff Burton died. That was like a big deal. For sure. And so, then it was like, okay, Nathan, you're 12 years old. Do you want to go to the U.S. championships or do you want to go to Monsters of Rock at L.A. Coliseum? And I had a broken arm, like, going to Monsters of Rock. <laughs> we went to Monsters of Rock, and uh, that was like Jason Newstead's first concert with Metallica before And Justice for All came out. Mm-hmm. And so they came out, and it was For Whom the Bell Tolls. You guys had the same thing at Day on the Green up there, I think, like the next week or something. Yeah. I think it was eight in uh but for whom the bell tolls came on and just everybody stormed the stage like riot. It was one o'clock in the afternoon, but they had all these chairs zip tied together. The yeah. whole field. Policy. So then as soon as for who, people just started whipping chairs uncontrollably, throwing the guard. Rip. My parents were because I had to go with my parents. Right. <laughs> and Christian went by himself. <laughs> but uh, I remember my parents grabbing me. And we ran up the side and the Metallica stopped and they said, hey, you guys, you got to blah, 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 calm down. You know, otherwise we can't play. And then um, and then they carried on. They played two songs off and Justice for All. But I just that was an insane show. And so full circle, I ended up getting to meet Kirk Hammett, right, for some Vans thing. Because he has houses over here and stuff or he lives in Hawaii. Uh So we and I'm like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And I tell him the story because I was just, you know, I was actually starstruck, but then kind of tripping. And then I was like, man. I remember I got to go to, you know, Monsters of Rock, L.A. Coliseum. Do you remember that show? And he was like, man, that was like our best show ever. He's all, when we went on stage, he's all, because they played with the Scorpions, Van Halen, all these other bands. Uh-huh. He's all, and think those bands knew who we were. And then once that went, and then they had to stop the crowd, he's all, and then at the end of that set, he's all, after that, everybody, like, that was a changing point for Metallica. They went from, like, a little bar band to, like, a stadium rock band, you know? We saw them do their anniversary at the Fillmore. They did a whole week, like five or six nights in a row. And each night, like one night they'd have Ozzy, one night they'd have King Diamond, and they would just play like all their covers with the dude that they're covering. It was insane. Yeah. It was really yeah. Cool. You, when I asked him, I'm all, what music did you like? What's your favorite like band or guitar players, Kirk? You know? Uh-huh. And he's all, UFO. <laughs> oh, really? And I was just like, yes. It was so <laughs> He's a full UFO fan. That's epic. Kirk Hammett's a badass. That's all I want to say. And Metallica, they've with, with Robert Trujillo, as as far as people and carrying through as a as a brand and a band and like being, you know, like I couldn't even imagine. So yeah, that's all Metallica for like upholding their reputation and just keeping it all the way. And that's another thing I'd like to say. Uh, you know, for me, like ZZ Top. What a badass band. What great people to look up to. And now it's like they're the longest uh, recording rock band in history. And so I just thought, you know, hats off to ZZ Top. Yeah, still doing it. Yeah, it's yeah. insane. Kurt Hammett had a house at uh, China Beach. He surfs. He's out there. Like when- Oh, yeah. He surfs over here, too. He has more neighbors. <laughs> oh, really? Well, he has a house down the road. and, and Yeah. You live by Arto? Uh, pretty close. Yeah, just- couple miles away okay rad yeah we were out there uh when was it february we went to the big island for our honeymoon it was fucking awesome so you got kids no we just got married how old are you (laughs) 52 (laughs) i don't think kids aren't in the cards i don't think so you're like jason's age yeah, or he he likes to tell me how how I'm older than him by like two months. <laughs> okay, yeah, because I think he's a little older than Christian. Yeah, he's <laughs> fifty three in December. I'm fifty three in October. Oh, really? Hmm. So Christian might be fifty one right now. What other obsessions do you have besides surfing in the fam? Are you are you getting into like juicing or working out or anything like other stuff or? Yeah, you know, I mean, I've done all that. Uh, um, whatever, but uh. Just uh, the breathing, bro. Oh, big, yeah. The big on the breathing and stretching. Stretching and breathing, I call it. Okay. Yeah, but it gets you to this other thing, and it's called yoga. But Like yoga would, and meditation? Yeah, but th- those words are just way over. <laughs> you don't, okay. I don't really like them because everybody that does it doesn't even do it. Uh-huh. Just say it. And so 
Right. Breathing, concentrated stretching and breathing. Yeah. I mean, as we get older, it seems more and more important, especially the stretching and the, and the breathing for mental, right? Yeah. The breath is your stretch. So it's like, if you can really get into your breath, like your stretch is so much better. Otherwise you just hold your breath while you stretch. And so it's like your muscles don't move. So it's like, I don't know. It's trippy. You just do it every day, every day, every day. And then things just change. Like your body changes, your mind changes. It's kind of hard to explain, but it just becomes easy. Just like, uh, say if you didn't push on a skateboard or you didn't paddle, you go your first time. It's super weird and awkward and hard, but you go a year straight every day for like 45 minutes and you can do it a lot better, you know? Right. So it's interesting. So your body's the same way, like even touching your toes or, uh, so a big thing for me is sitting cross-legged huh. almost couldn't do it, you know, have, uh, you know, a rod and six inch screws through my hip into my pelvis and all that. Fuck. Even sitting comfortably cross-legged is almost impossible for most, you know, grown men, which is pretty sad. Yeah. So I just try and work on that. Like I work on it every day. And so when I'm 70, um, I'm going to be a certain way. That's but the if I, thing. If I don't do anything, say I'm 46, if I don't do anything for the next 15 years, when I turn 60 or whatever, 14 years, I'm going to be a 60 year old guy, you know, and I'll surf and skated and have a good life, be stiff and you know, old. But if I do stretching and breathing and handstands and all this other shit every day, a little bit, Oh, I'm going to be able to go to the bathroom by myself. I'm going to be able to have, you know, like your balance, your cognitive skills, uh, the shit that makes you be able to be happy and exist and be independent. And mm -hmm. so that's the side effect. Yeah. We're, we're trying to get into that more and more me and my wife as well, just trying to just live healthier, basically like to put it simply, you know, whether it's but breathing, stretching or eating well or all that stuff. Well, I'm going to just say this cause I've had an epiphany. And so you know, I like to eat well, this and that. And I do my breathing, breath holds, blah, 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 all these different, you know, breathing exercises. And then I started really thinking about the breath. And I was like, if you don't eat, you know, you live for so long. If you don't drink water, you know, you live for so long, which is days, right? Yeah. But if you don't breathe, you're dying in two minutes, guaranteed three minutes at the longest. Mm -hmm. So once you tap into that, that's how much more important it is than food, than water. And then I was like, wait. What is your most important thing you have in this life? What's the most absolutely nothing more important? Breath. Your breath. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't matter if your parents love you. doesn't matter if your leg's on you. It doesn't matter what happens anytime. If you don't breathe for two or three minutes, you're dying, period. And it does nothing. You know, all that shit goes to hell. Or, right. you know what I mean? It's gone. And so, once you tap into it, that's how much power it has. And so it seems like there's nothing there because you do it automatically every day, you know, no big deal. But once you start concentrating on it and controlling it, then you start to get power from it. And then what I learned was once you connect to your breath, that's how you connect to your spirit. Mm. And when you connect to your spirit, then you're connected to your higher self, you know, and like you're connected with yourself and with all things. And so mm. Once you connect with all things, your life is just better. You know what I mean? And so every day it takes time and work and connection. And so uh, if you do that, if you take the time to do that and start with your breath, your muscles, your veins, your tendons, your tissues, your fibers, your life will start to all go in line, you know? And so it's like, if you can control those things, then you can control other things. You can control your anger. You can control your desires. You can control, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, like for anxiety, everything for everything. And so what does anxiety do? It shortens your breath. Why does it do that? Cause you can't think. So what does that do? It makes you angry. Um, <laughs> it, so it's, it's all a chain reaction to your breath. And okay. so when you go into yoga, it's all in the meditation. It's all connected to your breath. You go, and that's India, Eastern philosophy. You go to China. They got Tai Chi, moving meditation. That's all connected to your breath. You go to Bruce Lee. What does he tell you? A true master is a master of your breath. Strongest guy ever to live, right? You mm. think he was something else, but no. 
because if you can control your breath, you can control your heart rate, you can control your organs. Right. Right. And then Hicks and Gracie, toughest guy, beat everybody up. What would he do? He'd go do his breathing on the side of the ring, bring his heart rate up to 140. And then he would do his breathing and drop it down to 60, walk into the ring and just smoke guys because he already went through all his anxiety, all his his nerves. And so I'm not a fight. I'm not into that at all. But the fact is, like from the toughest guy to the guy who can hold his breath and do the longest dive to the master of yoga, to the master of Tai Chi, uh, you name it, it all connects to your breath. And so if you just work. Oh, and then Wim Hof. Do you know about Wim Hof? No. Well, that's another thing. Anybody out there who's looking to do research on all this stuff, dig up Wim Hof. And he's the first person to bring breath work to the laboratory setting and prove it under scientific scrutiny, hmm. what it does. So he, um, I think he was submerged in ice for two and a half hours. Ooh. He climbed Everest in his trunks, just doing his breathing. <laughs> Fuck. He ran in Namibia for two and a half days with uh, no water, just breathing. And so he did it all just to prove the science, but it's, those are all ancient techniques, you know? Um, he's just mastered them and then he's brought them to the West. And so if you look on vice, it's called Wim Hof. Wim Hof. Yeah. Is that uh, W H? Do you know? W I M H O F. Okay. I'll check that out. That's cool. Yeah. I'm interested in all that stuff. He's a huge sensation in the whole breathing thing. Um, but there's a bunch, you know, he's just the person who brought it to science and proved it. But then like Wim Hof says, you can go through all the literature and everything, all the, you know, all the books and all that. And he's all, it doesn't even matter because feeling is it believing it. So when you do it, then you know it because mm. you're feeling it. So people can say whatever, but it is truly you doing it and feeling it. If I was going to go this weekend with my wife and we've never seen anything, what uh, surf movie or documentary do we need to get under our belt? Could be a couple if it's there. I mean, I know there's a laundry list. But- you would want to do like free and easy. What's the other one? Jimi Hendrix, Rainbow Bridge, you know, just to get some history and then Morning of the Earth and then finish it maybe with the movie North Shore, which is a Hollywood version of North Shore. Okay. And then the Jake Phelps question is, what does Skate and Destroy mean to you? Mm, What does Skate and Destroy mean to me? Yeah. Well, there's definitely different meanings. But as I was a kid, it was like you skate it and you ruin that thing. You destroy it it's broken you break the pool coat you do that you you know what i mean now it's like i think of it as like you know skate and just destroy conformity right (laughs) destroy like what you want think of the world and what it should be just do away with what is Uh uh-huh to whatever's coming and is natural you know what i mean it's just like who knows okay rad you got a good song you'd like to um take it out of here with well, I just posted a song and it was by a tribe called Red, Electric Powwow, some Indians, dubstep. I don't know. We'll do that. What they are, but it's kind of just whatever, or it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's something nobody really hears, something different from wild Indians chanting. Okay. Hell yeah. Or you could end it with a ZZ Top, got to get paid. Okay. <laughs> I like it. We'll open with the other one and we'll end it with the ZZ Top. Hell yeah. I really appreciate this. It's, it's fucking awesome, man. I, I, so much respect. Okay, Rad. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the opportunity, man. Cheers. Me too. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Talking Schmidt. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Anchor, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. When you subscribe, you'll get notifications every Tuesday of new episodes the minute they become available. Also, please leave reviews and a five-star rating. It's the best way to help the show grow. All of the episodes will always remain free, but if you would like to help support the show, you can do so at TalkingSchmidt.com, where you can pick up some merchandise like t-shirts, beanies, hats, and stickers. The website has an entire archive of all of the episodes, with extra photos and videos. Email us with any suggestions, comments, or ways that the show may have improved your life at TalkingSchmidt at gmail.com. All interviews are conducted, edited, and produced by Schmitty. The intro music is Mary's Cross by the band Nature. 
A very special shout out goes to the executive director, Cheryl Camisa. Shout out. Love it! This is Talking Schmidt, where the Rolodex is deep, but the conversation is deeper.